Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Technopolis Workplace Talks and Networking featuring Afsegura. The theme for today is what should business leaders consider for 2021? My name is Amel Gailey, and I'm very excited to be your host for this afternoon. We actually, we have close to 800 participants registered for this event, leaders from all over the world. So we can all rest assured that we are in a great online company. And actually, I, I want to encourage you that for the next 75 minutes or so, put away your cell phone, close all the other tabs on your, on your desktop browser, or, or maybe hide them so you won't be distracted and, and really sit back and enjoy these inspiring thoughts and, and discussions that you're about to hear. Let's start with introducing our, our host. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Techn Technopolis chain, which is actually a huge community these days. It spans across six countries, over 15 campuses, and is home to over 1,400 customers. And there's over 45,000 people utilizing their spaces. Also under the Technopolis chain is the IUMA co-working spaces, which actually operates in, in 10 different locations as well. Now, this afternoon is not only about this live event, but there's a lot going on in Brella as well. And I want to really encourage you to utilize those networking opportunities as well. So please visit Brella. You can either scourge and, and look for, for meetings yourself, or you can let Brella's AI-based matchmaking tool do all the work for you. But I really, I want to challenge you, book at least two meetings for yourself, either today, tomorrow, or by the end of business Friday. I know you can do it. So just as a reminder, Brella will be functioning for today, tomorrow, and Friday. So even after this live stream is over, this event and, and matchmaking opportunities are by no means over. They're just about to be and just about to begin. You know all those people who always talk about these random chance encounters that they meet people in the strangest of locations and, and it ends up being a fantastic business opportunity that puts them on a different growth trajectory? Well, you know, that could be you, and you could find your match in Brella. But what it does require is a little bit of, of guts and bravery and, and getting out of your comfort zone. So really, I, I want to encourage you to utilize that. Uh, there's also great booths, virtual booths that you can visit in, in Brella as well with a lot of content and, and um, expert guidance, be it about the future workplace or, or cybersecurity threats. So really take advantage of that opportunity as well. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers today, and I know you cannot wait to get this show on the road. Uh, today we're going to hear from, from three distinguished leaders. We're going to hear from Lina Mascolune, who is a business unit director from Technopolis, Lithuania. We're going to hear from Risto Silasma, chairman and founder of Afsekure and former chairman of Nokia, and Mikko Hyppenen, global cybersecurity expert and chief research officer at Afsekure. Briefly looking at the program, we're going to kick off with Risto's speech regarding how do we prepare for the future. Then we're going to move on to Lina's speech. It's the end of the work as we know it, and I feel fine. Then we're going to hear from Mika talking about un unpredictable times, changing the cyber threat landscape. And we are going to hear a great discussion by Risto and Mika as well regarding trends in the business and workplace. Um, as always, social media <laughs> needs to be uh, lifted up and, and reminded. So we want to encourage you to have an active discussion in Twitter as well. You can reach out to our speakers by tagging Technopolis, Technopolis headquarters, or Risto's handle is rsilasma. Mikko can be reached at Mikko. And the hashtag for this event is hashtag workplace talks. Now, Who's ready to hear how companies should be planning the future of work? I can just imagine all of you raising hands. Don't leave me hanging here. And um, let's get started. So it is my great pleasure to present to you the chairman and founder of Afsekure, former chairman of Nokia. Risto's passion and mission has always been to elevate Nordic entrepreneurship to compete with Silicon Valley. He has invested in and worked with over 30 startups and growth companies. Two of those have already developed into unicorns, and many others are bubbling and on that path. That is a very impressive track record. He's an entrepreneur at heart and our special guest, Risto Silasma. Welcome, along with digital uh, virtual applause. Thanks, Emil. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I think we all agree that rarely have things been as unpredictable as they are at the moment. But they are also very complicated issues that we are dealing with. And that combination of unpredictability and complicatedness can be defined as complexity. And when we deal with complex things, we need to change our behavior. The uncertainties we are facing include, of course, COVID-19, uh, tech cold war between the United States and China, climate warming looming in the background when we get over the current acute challenges we'll still have to face with that huge enemy. So when you think about how you should behave under these circumstances, think of your operating model and competitiveness as a network of capabilities and behaviors. As the circumstances force you to change something, for example, increase remote work, don't think that all the other things that you do can remain the same. Because when one piece of the network changes, in order for you to find the balance again, you need to change some of the other pieces as well. And partially because of this network nature of your operating model, and partially because of the complex, i.e. the unpredictability and complicatedness of our environment, it has probably never been as difficult to plan. And I'd like to suggest to you that whatever your plan is, never before has it been as likely that that plan will fail. Because some of the assumptions upon which the plan is based on are wrong. So how do you manage that uncertainty? Let's think about a very classical company, a hierarchical top-down company. How does that company manage uncertainty? It manages that by creating a plan, typically a single plan. And it creates that plan through a waterfall-based process, a leader-led top-down hierarchical process. And that works okay-ish when the cycles of change are long. When the clock speed increases, that way of managing a business doesn't work anymore. And you need more agility. How do you achieve that agility? You need to increase experimentation. Maybe you can simulate the future in order to predict which experiments you should be running. But in any case, you need not to rely on a single plan. I believe in scenario planning as a great tool to use under such circumstances. And I have a very simple process for that. There are a few steps in that. First, identify some scenarios. You can think about what is the worst that could happen? What is the best that could happen? Typically, that is your current plan. You can think of some discrete outcomes, like President Trump will continue to, the, to be the president of the United States for life. That's hopefully an unlikely outcome. But you can come up with certain discrete outcomes. And then you can also define certain dimensions, for example, high GDP growth, increased tension between the West and East. And then you have a four square of both being high, both being low, and one being high and one being low. And you can define each one of those as one scenario, or whatever is applicable to your business. Once you have those scenarios, you ask yourself, what kind of data would tell me in advance, give me foresight, towards which one of those scenarios are we heading to? And then you just start collecting that data. You start buying that data. You start generating that data. And then you constantly gain, on a daily basis, further insight and foresight as to what will be happening. And then you create action plans for each one of those scenarios. Think of those scenarios as paths towards the future. And for each path, you have an action plan. 
And you don't wait to start executing on that plan until you are sure that this is the future. Actually start executing right away. For the negative outcomes, you start executing actions to mitigate, to minimize the likelihood of that happening and enabling you, enabling you to be successful even if it happens. For the positive scenarios, of course, you start acting to increase the likelihood of those happening. And therefore, when you take action, your people feel more in control and you are more in control. And then you start shifting your resources, your investments between the different scenarios. As you learn more, and some of them become extinct, maybe new ones are created, some become more likely, some less likely. And you can assign your resources in an optimal way. It's clear that COVID-19 has changed many things for all of us. And some of those changes have been absolutely good. Some of them have been absolutely bad. And many good in moderation, but not necessarily good if we have to go to the extreme. And we just need to separate the good from the bad, because the, the good things we want to make permanent, the bad things we want to mitigate. And again, we come back to the, the beginning, i.e. Once you change one piece of your activities, you need to look at all the other pieces as well to regain the balance. For remote work, which is something that we have all had to do more, and for some of us that's absolutely good, for some of us it's absolutely bad, but for all of us it's part of our daily lives nowadays. So in order to maximize the benefits of remote work, you need to look at that whole network of activities, capabilities and pieces of competitiveness. And one way for you to get a jump start to that is to look at some companies that have been fully remote from their inception. And you can easily find playbooks of such companies online. And you don't need to apply everything that they do to your own activities, but you can learn from the things that they have done in order to be 100% remote from the beginning. Myself, I decided that my boards will have to start wor working differently. And very simple things changed. I decided that every other board meeting will have to be remote from now on, so that we can get the benefits of that remote meeting model but every other one will have to be physical as soon as we get out of the lockdowns. For the remote meetings, they have to, be, have to be remote for every single participant. So even if we are physical in the same location, we have to be in separate rooms. For the physical events, we make them more physical, more social, more interaction, more lunches, more meetings, meeting a lot of people to maximize the opportunity of what is physical. And then for the remote meetings, more reviews, more <clears throat> tactical topics, less brainstorming, less strategy, which belong to the physical meetings. So <clears throat> think about your operating model. Think about the sources of your competitiveness and think about how you need to change all of those as you're being forced to change some aspects of your behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much, Risto. That was very inspiring. Great thoughts and also a lot of very concrete advice. Very much looking forward to, to hearing you continue your thoughts in, in the discussion section as well. Now, moving on with the program, I'd like to introduce our next guest speaker, Lina Maskolune. She is the business unit director for Technopolis in Lithuania. She has been working in the field of real estate for the past 20 years, and like many other young executives, she has learned to work hard and strive relentlessly for results. 
Now, let's hear her story and vision on the future of work life. And I have to say at this point, Lena, kudos to you on the topic or title of your speech, because it is really difficult to say it's the end of work as we know it, and I feel fine without getting into a song about it. So welcome, Lena. You are joining us online, as is custom in, in 2020 for most cases. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for such an introduction. And uh, it, I have to say, it's not, uh, it's not, these are not my words. These are the words of R.E.M. song. And I think it fits the, uh, my feeling uh, today a lot, uh, how I feel about this changing and opportunities that come uh, with them. Um, and I'm very glad today to see such an extensive number of uh, participants. And of course, welcome everyone from Technopolis. Uh, uh, to, to this the, the um, splendid discussions uh, that are waiting uh, for us. Uh, so uh, today uh, we are talking, I'm, to, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the work and um, uh, how, uh, just a second, um, um, that, you know, today you see I'm wearing the, um, the not a business uniform that I would typically wear in the studio there with you guys, but uh, I'm working from home, and uh, and this is my business uniform when I'm working from home, uh, and because I will be talking today about different work reality. Uh, last year, at least at real estate, uh, we all felt some change is coming, uh, approaching in the year. Some called it crisis. Econo some economists called it a recession and slower economic growth, because uh, as for me, at least myself, I define crisis as something very unexpected, very unpredictable, that you cannot see it coming. And here we are. Um, none, however, none of us has predicted such a scenario in our project contingency plans, in our lease or uh, contract uh, or turnkey agreements and or our insurance policies. Perhaps uh, Wimbledon was the only one who did and uh, got a good insurance payout afterwards. So over the past uh, nine months, uh, we have seen the world in crisis. Our uh, fancy, nice offices stay empty with people working from home, multitasking between their work and family duties. Social distancing and, and masks become our reality. And video conferencing and conferences like this uh, is uh, become our uh, daily routine. We see announcements from global organizations uh, uh, delaying uh, their people coming back to work uh, due to a second wave of pandemic. And um, uh, just this fall, uh, Pinterest uh, has exploded the market with the announcement of lease termination in their newly developing 45,000 square meter office space in San Francisco for about uh, 90 million US dollars in penalty. Is this the end of the work of the uh, of the world of the office era? Is this the uh, uh, end of the work as we know it? Uh, will the offices stay empty, uh, like dead and silent places that will eventually be transformed into flea markets or kids' playgrounds? Uh, let's take a deeper look into this. Since the origins in ancient uh, Rome times, the offices have been changing. Uh, and adopting to the new reality. Uh, it, they have developed in as a reflection of the times related with significant events, wars or pandemics and uh, major global innovations uh, and also changing people habits and needs. Uh, latest global megatrends uh, have driven the whole economy to the shared economy and a lot of products that have been created in shared economy uh, in offices, uh, the co-working uh, was the answer to the shared economy and the needs that are rising with them. Uh, co-working, as you know, have been uh, rising in the double digits uh, in all over the world uh, just uh, lately uh, during the last few years. Uh, all these shared economy products are supporting the people need to belong uh, the basic human need, uh, which is supporting also this collaboration and socialization and staying connected. We are humans. We are social beings that need interaction. We need recognition. We need to express. And, and uh, actually, we see uh, in other people's our mirror. And uh, 
uh, it, 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 that's why such spaces as co-working, co-living, social hubs, social networks, communities are supporting our basic human needs. Isn't it paradoxical that the pandemic uh, hit exactly these uh, basic human needs uh, and, and areas uh, among them mostly? However, people want to work from home or flexibly to support the well-being and work-life balance because today they see a lot of benefits and advantages from working from home. An increased level of productivity, flexibility, time saved to, to the office commune, and a, an ability to better combine work and private life responsibilities. And the businesses are supporting um, and adopting uh, and supporting the work from home. Uh, uh, over 70% of global organizations support work from home today compared to almost 60% uh, prior to the outbreak because the businesses clearly see benefits um, in people working from home. Uh, not only the cost saving, which is, a, of course, the important factor, but also if it's with green agenda and, of course, they have expanded the access to diverse talent pools, which is not uh, today uh, is stuck to the geographical borders, actually. So um, having looked at this evidence, um, the, there's only one conclusion that comes to my mind, uh, that remote uh, work and work from home is here to stay forever. So is it, is it, can we say that the office is dead? Uh, well, however paradoxic is to hear that from me as an office representative, but I, I would like you to think about that in your organizations. That might be true, but uh, this is not a short-term change. Uh, this is all burning and all destroying earthquake that will give long-term effects and consequences. Thus, before jumping into prompt conclusions, please consider all, uh, all the aspects of it and uh, avoid significant risks. I can share that uh, during this summer especially, I have received a lot of calls from my customers and friends and acquaintances asking me for advice. Uh, they were saying that they have uh, carried out employee surveys that indicated, uh, that showed that, that about 30% of their employees want to work from home Another approximately a 30%, 40% want to combine the work from home and work in the office. And then, and, uh, the, the last 30% want to work in the office. And they said, Lina, what should we do? Should we reduce the office space already now? Uh, the only smart uh, advice that I could give them at that time was to wait and do the same survey in fall, late fall or winter again. Uh, when... Uh, it will be dark outside, right, like right now, when people will start feeling lonely and uh, they will uh, normally want to show, socialize. Maybe they will be surprised with the, uh, you will be surprised with survey results, maybe not, but at least you have lived through the whole cycle of, the, uh, of this uh, pandemic and uh, you can hear them better and uh, understand what are the true needs of people uh, are. Um, also, back in June, I have uh, we have uh, received from one customer a termination notice um, saying that they plan to reorganize the company and shut down the Lithuania office because their sales have dropped down them dramatically due, uh, as, a, as a consequence of first pandemic and uh, they don't need the Lithuanian office anymore. Well, it's a sad uh, event, but uh, I couldn't do much about it. However, in the, just in a couple of months, in the beginning of September, I received another call from the same lady saying that, can we recall this, uh, this termination notice? Because our, uh, in July, our uh, sales not only bounced back, but they have increased because we saw a lot of opportunities. And we need not only the Lithuanian office, but we need a larger office in the future. These examples illustrate that still there is a lot of uncertainty in the market and in our decisions as well. Um, uh, because yet we are not ready to work remotely fully. We still work remotely the same way as we worked at the office, like having a feeling that it's temporarily. Uh, the work and life balance at homes is deteriorating. And although people have adjusted after first pandemic, 
uh, how to work and how to uh, to stay away from the office and work online. Uh, still, we all feel that it's temporary, and soon, very soon, we will get back to the offices. Uh, uh, and people, you can see more people now in the offices during the second wave, all uh, despite lockdowns and quarantines in some countries. Productivity, motivation, and engagement are decreasing, and people don't because people don't meet their peers. Uh, they lack social life, and uh, or just somebody asking, "How are you?" And managers cannot ensure accountability results and start losing control. Because the basic human needs to belong and communicate didn't change during pandemic. Thus, today uh, we see a lot, uh, uh, that employees are not as productive working from home uh, anymore. Uh, not all of us have homes fit for work from home. Not all of us live in happy families. Uh, there are many lonely and detached people around us that lose motivation and productivity just because they don't have anyone to talk to and share their concerns. And I see this problem uh, of all of us, not only our employees, but also managers, as we feel left alone with our dropping results, deteriorating employee motivation. And most often we don't have anyone simply asking us, how are you doing? And I would like to share one more um, story of mine that this summer, um, after finding out that one of our best uh, business unit directors and one of the best sales experts in the group uh, has is suffering or is experiencing uh, 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 de decline in the motivation of the team, I just uh, dropped him a message. How are you? I got a call in five minutes and we talked about an hour. We shared our concerns, we, we shared our experiences, and we both admitted at the end that the best, uh, what we are missing and the, the, the best time that we all, uh, when we met was when we had our management uh, meeting dinners uh, where we could share our not only business results, but our private concerns at the, at the office uh, where we could uh, share our experiences and learn from each other. So that we cannot do or we can do um, differently online. And that does not create the same bond as we would work in the office. And we can see that business already struggle reaching results. Uh, and you're, most of you uh, know uh, Fortnite uh, game. And that the Fortnite uh, end of the season live event was uh, delayed. Um, and although Epic Games do not uh, declare that that was due to um, uh, problems uh, related with COVID pandemic, but uh, knowing how sacred this date for the uh, Epic Games is, uh, that must be uh, related with the productivity of employees uh, working from home. Uh, if we look at the workplace as a physical space in the future, uh, how it will look like, experts say that it will be a highly flexible people-centric model that combines a variety of locations, including our homes and experiences to support convenient functionality and well-being. Uh, what I say is just a physical infrastructure. A combination of people needs and the global uh, restrictions due to pandemic is leading us to something very different, something very new, a completely new way of working, a major prompt shift of focus from result to people. Some of you will say there's nothing new in that, but I can say that this shift is very, very important for the future. Uh, because a shift towards a more remote workforce would require more than a simple change of location of the office. And it will require a skilling employee and yourself as the manager, but also it will require introducing new management practices and styles, uh, new performance measurements, because as we work from home, it is very hard to control uh, what people do and how they do it. Uh, it will. We will need to... Um, embrace and we will need to uh, empower people to open up with their transformational mindset and to do all that with full trust and full transparency. So I believe that the true workspace is among the people in the organization and it does not really matter is your office and uh, where is your office and how is it set up. This vice is agile, it is invisible, it is non-measurable, there, but very, very intuitively sensible. 
this space is a key business accelerator, source of power and innovation, and the manager is in the center of it. A challenge for the manager is to keep the special space uh, safeguarded despite you work in the office or remotely, and we have to get ready for it. I have to disappoint you, but we are not getting back to normal. We are waiting for the pandemic to end but, uh, and get back to normal, but it won't. We expect uh, the employees will flood the, our offices uh, very soon, but they won't. We have to get ready for a major change, not postpone it. We need a transformational, a transformational thinking to kick in. For a manager, it might mean giving up full control and starting trusting. It is a path of change, and the longer you're stuck in the tunnel forward to the new beginning, the more painful the change will be. Ultimately, if we succeed, the result will be what we, the all, good companies always wanted, a safe environment for our people that can create and enjoy the work, collaborate with the peers and colleagues, and subsequently achieve the objectives of our organizations with or without the office, that is not essential. And last but not least, I would like to shortly share my story. As uh, I was introduced, I was always a hardworking uh, young manager, but is result oriented. I thought I was demanding, but very, very caring and open manager. And I was selecting only strong people with the good values to the team. Uh, I always uh, strived to find a successor, but I didn't succeed to do that in, in, te in Technopolis. Eventually, after um, about one and a half year ago, I became bored because I've made a lot of good big deals and uh, it's been 70 a year in, in the company. And I felt that everything is becoming a routine and I need to something new until I learned about self-management model. It attracted my attention because I always said that my team, this strong team that I have gathered, has a lot of unlocked potential and true natural abilities, creativity that can be unleashed, somehow unleashed and employed for the benefit of the business and the result. So with the support of CEO, I launched the pilot uh, project in our BU. Then came COVID and we all went to our homes. Um, we had to, I had to take care of employees, we had to take care of our customers, but it gave me a wonderful time and a wonderful chance and finally time to turn to my, from results to people. And finally, I saw them not as a tool to uh, achieve my own result, but as to ask them and to basically, what do you need to achieve our result together? So, this uh, self-management uh, pilot project was right on time. I also realized, I found out that uh, managers are humans too. And when I spoke to my employees, uh, I realized that um, us managers, we also have our dreams, fears, belief, uh, and uh, motivational slowdowns and need for support. So I, with this self-management uh, uh, model, I also really receive a lot of that from my uh, employees, which is support. And I don't know where and how my journey and all our managerial experiment will end up. But I feel that this can unlock a huge potential that we have in the team. And I fully trust my team and myself. Without them working on site or at the at the office or or at the homes, I'm not uh, able to accomplish any of our goals. I'm not able to create value to our uh, a shareholder. I'm not I'm not able to serve our uh, customers uh, with five star customer service. Uh, they are my heart, my hands, my uh, eyes, my legs, uh, and I really care of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. That was very inspiring. And, and it's always great to hear personal stories. It's, it's easy to, to connect to that and, and uh, resonate to that. So, so thank you for, very much for that. Um, moving on with thank the, you. Uh, moving on then with the agenda, we'll, we'll touch base with you again, Lena, in the Q&A section. But now it's time for our third speaker of the afternoon. He 
um, has the most watched online security TED Talk in the history of the internet. He is a global security expert, or perhaps I should rephrase that. He is, is in many ways the global security expert and chief research officer at F-Secure. Uh, the topic that he's going to be talking about is, is, is how unpredictable times change the cyber threat landscape. And I'm not sure if, if the topic could be any more hotter or, or more timely. It's definitely current here in Finland at the moment, but it is so everywhere in the world. So please help me welcome our online security rock star, Mikko Hyppönen. Thank you, Amel. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. I've been working with computer security and computer privacy all my life. And I, um, I've often compared it to playing a game of Tetris. Because we all know how Tetris works. You try to combine these pieces to make a full line. And if you succeed, the result disappears. So your successes disappear, but your failures pile up. Unfortunately, the same is true for trying to build network security or info security or computer security. If you do your job perfectly, then nothing happens. If you fail, everybody will see it. And we've seen many examples of such failures during this unusual and unpredictable year. No one expected that we would all go home working remotely, but that's what all companies were forced to do if the employees were working in a line of business which could be done remote. And for many of us, that jump wasn't so drastic because we were already used to doing some work remote or working on the road from airports, from hotels. But many of us who work with computers day in and day out actually were not working with laptops. For example, think about architects who typically have high-end powerful desktops that they work with. Well, they weren't doing remote work with those, but now they are doing remote work with those. And this has been one of the big shifts that companies were forced to do. Move all employees home, equip all employees with remote working capabilities, make sure you have enough bandwidth for remote connections, remote video meetings, make sure everybody has VPNs, make sure you can update the remote workforce. In fact, it's quite surprising how well we fared. We are lucky that this pandemic didn't happen 10 years ago. Like 10 years ago, we had the building blocks, but we definitely would not have been ready to execute like we were ready to execute in 2020. The bandwidth that we have around the world in many cases has been surprisingly good, not just for us to watch video, but to actually upload videos so we can do real time meetings. I guess what I'm trying to say is that next time you see one of your IT people that has been keeping up the company and making sure everybody can work remotely, give him a hug or give her a hug. Or if you don't feel like hugging, you know, thumbs up. Heroic work has been done to make sure company, companies can continue to work and employees can continue to work remotely. Now, we also know that some corners have been cut to enable all this. One easy metric is that when we scan publicly accessible servers online, we actually now see more publicly accessible corporate file servers, file servers which are now outside of the corporate firewall of the company, because something had to be done to enable employees which are working from home without proper remote access to be able to continue working. Sure, you can try to mitigate the risk by having strong authentication, but the fact is that you're now exposing things online that you were not exposing before the pandemic. And when you have to do things very quickly, it's easy to mislook things left and right. Another thing that is quite obvious is that scared people are easier to fool. And during these unusual times, all of us have been scared. And that's an easy recipe for the attackers to use when they are trying to fool people with 
phishing attacks or malicious links or malicious attach attachments sent over email or sent over WhatsApp or, or other mechanisms. This is why we've seen so many cases where people receive emails, w for example, warning them about an outbreak in their neighborhood and click here to see a map of the infections. Many people click before thinking twice or fake emails or messages coming from the government to promise you free money because governments are giving free money in many countries to individuals. And these offers might not be coming from your government. So using these tricks to fool people works better during unusual times because people are scared. So what works there? Well, education works there, but education is the hardest thing we have. I mean, we can look at all of the security problems, every single data breach, every data leak we've ever had, and they've always been caused either by a technical problem or by a human problem. And technical problems can be hard to fix, but they are fixable. Basically, you find the bug, you fix the bug, you, you patch all the machines. But there's no patch for human brains. The only way we can fix people's brains is through education, and that is hard. It might be the hardest challenge we have. And when we look at actual cases that have happened during this unusual year, for example, the Twitter hack is a good example on what kind of attacks we see now. Twitter was hacked in June. That's the biggest data breach Twitter has ever seen. And that data breach started with a phone call targeting one of their engineers and the caller claimed to be from the IT team asking questions about VPN problems. We've been reported you've had problems with your connections to the workplace. Well, pretty much everybody has had some kind of problems with connections to the work workplace, so it's a pretty easy story to get started to fooling people into giving access to their machines. Another example is what happened in Norway during this pandemic year. The Norfund State Fund uh, was a victim of a business email compromise attack. These are the attacks where employees are fooled by phone calls or emails which claim to be from the top management and then used that access to reroute money traffic. In that particular case, they were able to change account numbers and when the real recipients of the money who were waiting for funds to come in did not get their funds and were calling or actually they were emailing back to the, to the senders, the crooks answered the emails on behalf of the real people explaining that this is because of the pandemic. We have some delays in payments, I'm sure you understand, which is a pretty good cover story. So these kind of things are going on around us. Scared people are easier people to fool. Changing landscape for our network architecture gives opportunities for the attackers. And if we want to be able to defend our networks, it's no longer enough to just to try to keep all the attackers out all the time. We have to assume that they will get in anyway. And then we have to focus on being able to detect when there is a breach so we can react when there is a breach. But in the end, I guess we're all playing a never ending game of security Tetris. When you succeed, nothing happens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. What an inspiring talk and, and lots of great examples. Perhaps I should say scary examples a little bit, but it's always best to learn from, from real, real live cases. So thank you so much. I want to remind you all of, of the live conversations we're hoping to have in Twitter, so you can reach both of our, our great F-Secure speakers either at R. Silasma or at Mikko. Those are the Twitter handles. Also, the Technopolis handle is, is Technopolis HQ. Next in our, in our fantastic program is a discussion on the future trends and, um, in business and work life. So, Risto and Mikko, the floor is yours. Hey, Mikko, you talked about how things have changed over the pandemic time. Have the, the bad people changed? Is there honor among thieves? One would expect that if we have a common enemy, we all unite in front of that common enemy. And COVID-19 is a common enemy. Mm. So have we united or not? 
in the very beginning of the pandemic, um, in, in early weeks of March, one of the first worries we had was that like all the hospitals, all the clinics, all the medical people who are trying to treat people with, with COVID-19 are using computers as well, and they mm -hmm. are being attacked as well. So I actually put out a public plea on, on Twitter to, especially on ransom gangs, the gangs which encrypt and, and lock down systems, to stay away from hospitals. And I wasn't really expecting a, a um, uh, any kind of response from them. I, I guess I was just trying to like make them realize that what they're doing is actually a matter of life and death. Surprisingly, uh, multiple ransom gangs, like organized crime gangs, put out public statements saying that they will try to stay away from hospitals. Mm -hmm. They will steer away from hospitals. So in that sense, um, yeah, I guess some of them do have um, honor among thieves. Unfortunately, not all of them. Have we seen any, any change in the number of attacks? Sure. There's been clearly less attacks against hospitals and medical institutions and clinics and medical research institutions. Mm -hmm. For example, the ones targeting or, or trying to create a cure. Um, unfortunately, not all of them have stopped. We have clear evidence that some of these medical research institutions trying to create a cure or some kind of an antidote have been targeted by spies. So mm -hmm. governmental attacks trying to create some kind of an edge for their own um, research by stealing um, some kind of medical research from other countries. We've seen examples of that. And yes, we have seen attacks against medical institutions. One tragic case in, in Dusseldorf, which involved uh, a, an elderly lady dying. Most likely that particular case wasn't, the death wasn't directly a result of a ransomware attack, but there was a ransomware attack in that particular clinic. We've seen one very large-scale attack in the United States, and then, of course, here in Finland, um, there is the case Vastamo, which has been, now been in headlines for mm. uh, three weeks already. Why don't you talk a little bit about that case, because it's, it's such a large case, case that it's globally somewhat unique. It is unique. Um, we are here in Finland, and it's, of course, pretty obvious to everybody that it's, it's a huge case and it's in the headlines, but it actually is unique worldwide. So this is a, a blackmail attack, not a ransomware attack. There's no malware involved at all. It's a blackmail attack against the psychotherapy clinic, which started already two years ago when the database of tens of thousands of psychotherapy clinic patients were stolen from a private clinic. Attackers started blackmailing the company, a private company behind this clinic um, in September. And this became public then uh, in October, as the attacker started publicly leaking patient information. And to make this even more unique, the attacker changed tactics and actually emailed every single victim. So mm -hmm. tens of thousands of Finnish patients of this clinic got a blackmail email demanding a Bitcoin payment of 200 euros. And the, the total amount of victims is completely unusual. We, we have some cases we could compare to this to internationally, um, but nothing with these numbers. And this is the only known case where a psychotherapy clinic has lost the patient notes and they are being blackmailed for those. Mm. Now how about the, the white hat side? For example, our own people. We have 1,700 people working in F-Secure. How do they react when this critical piece of our society, the healthcare sector, is being attacked during a time of a global pandemic. I guess, I guess the most combining property of people who work with computer security is that they want to help. Um, basically, that's why I'm working mm -hmm. for F-Secure, why I've worked for F-Secure all my life. Um, when I talk to people within F-Secure or in other security companies, these are people who could work anywhere, like great technical skills, great developers, great researchers, great minds. They could easily be working, building operating systems or search engines or games, but they choose to work in information security because that's where they believe they can use their skills for good. And when the pandemic started, we saw um, grassroots movements in different parts of the world where volunteers who were working with information security were volunteering their time and energy to help medical sector. For example, uh, 
Kyber VPK movement here in Finland mm-hmm. and, and, and similar movements in, in other parts of the world. And especially sort of a voluntary fire brigade. That's basically what it is. Voluntary fire brigade for information security mm-hmm. fires. And in this case Vastamo um basically all security people in Finland who who have anything they can help with have spent their time trying to mm-hmm. figure out who is behind the attack and we wouldn't wish anything more than than finding um mm-hmm. finding the, the attackers and bringing them to justice because that's that's clearly what what needs to be done but i guess part of the problem is really like how how do private companies treat their data like clearly in Vastama case something was done wrong because this data was being stolen so let me ask you um this goes all the way to the top management and board level at companies if we want to be able to safeguard our data and i'm not really sure if we are doing this right like how how can we be sh- how can we change things so that the top management and and board level members of companies would constantly think about these things not just when something like case Vastamo happens but mm. in the long run you know the the challenge for the top management is that typically they don't understand too much about cybersecurity but there are other many other things that they are not deep level experts in and yet the company has to be pretty good at all of those things cybersecurity included and when you sit on the board or you are in the management team you are the CEO and there's something that you you worry about yet you don't understand it and you realize that this is something where i will never become an expert in so what what do you really do and how do you understand sort of enough to give the right support because that's your role you your role is to enable things to happen you, your mm. role is to you're a service function right you're serving the employees enabling them to do what they should be doing to do that you need to establish certain principles and of course we have a number of let's say maturity models that leadership teams can use to define what their cybersecurity maturity is mm. and set objectives boards of course that supervise the management teams and whose duty is to understand whether the company is led well mm-hmm. and if it's not led well then they need to change the management the question is should they be using that same metric hmm. and i have sometimes thought that maybe at least board should have a discussion on whether we sh- we should have a board maturity model i e is our board mature in dealing with cyber security and the board is not going out to to let's say manage the firewalls well i hope not yeah it, it wouldn't end well but the board needs to understand whether we are supervising the management team in the right way whether we are enabling them and supporting them in the right way and that would be a good discussion to have mm. but there's no easy solution mm. but there are many standards there are many publicly available tools that both management teams and boards can use and i think they should at least discuss whether those tools should be different can you give some example of metrics that boards could actually measure to to find out how well they're doing well one question is you can just ask all the board members a few questions each one would be what do you think our maturity in cybersecurity is in this company and if the numbers or the responses are all over the place mm. then you don't know that okay we we don't know what we are doing right and you can come up easily with the number of similar questions and then when you realize that you don't really know where we are then you definitely also don't know where you're going yeah but let, let me ask you something that i've been thinking about because now with covid we have had to change the way companies work the increase in remote work is the easiest mm-hmm. most visible outcome to enable people to work externally we have had to change some aspects of our it systems and some of those have opened up new vulnerabilities 
So can you talk a little bit about what those might be? Mm -hmm. So what kind of changes are risky? Mm -hmm. And yet we have had to do those. Mm -hmm. And maybe we will talk a little bit about zero trust after that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, when you change your network topology, you end up having with new, totally new kind of vulnerabilities. It comes down to the fact that we are using a network protocol that routes. The internet is built on top of TCP IP and the biggest innovation that I think about in what really made TCP IP the protocol to change the world is that if it tries to connect from point A to point B and it fails, it will retry, it will find a new route. This is great because it enables connectivity and this really means that internet is as durable as it is. The downside is if you want to keep something out of the net, if you want to keep something you know, internal, this becomes increasingly hard. And it's especially hard when you are changing your network topology as companies have done during this, this pandemic. Another example is when, for example, two companies merge and you join their networks mm -hmm. and you have different kind of connectivity and VPNs and remote connectivity points and RDPs which enable remote connections and you might end up exposing things which were not supposed to be on the public net. So the routing functionality of the protocol we use means that if something can be exposed, it doesn't matter how complex the route to public internet is, TCP IP will find it. Mm. And now many companies have had to open services that used to be internal to the local area networks out to the public internet because many of their workers are remote. That's, that's exactly what has happened. And the, the companies which probably have suffered least from these changes are the kind of companies which have embraced what we call zero trust. Zero trust, in a nutshell, means a network which doesn't have an internal network at all. There is no external, there is no internal, there is no firewall, there is just a network. Zero trust um, has been built by many companies over the years, but the best known example is Google. Google is using zero trust um, network in their own use, which, for example, when they use email, they use the same Gmail as anyone else could use, which is in the public web. When they handle documents, they use Google Docs, which is the same Google Docs anybody else can use. There is no internal network. There is no VPN you would need to be able to access company confidential information. Confidential information is safeguarded in, in other means, with authentication of the users and of the devices and with profiles. So a certain user doing certain tasks at certain time has access to certain data. Mm -hmm. And this is obviously much more complicated to build than bringing a huge firewall which sets the untrusted and trusted networks mm -hmm. apart. But then there is no soft, mushy internals, which once you gain access to beyond the firewall, then you, you have free reign into everything. And in this particular case, um, this has worked well. So I, we do expect zero trust slowly and surely become the norm. Obviously, nowadays, it's, it's much easier for a startup company to start straight ahead from this than an existing company which has been building their networks for decades. And incidentally, as it happens, we have sort of been founded upon that philosophy already from 20 years back when we started talking about this medieval castle with high firewalls around it being old-fashioned and the, the workplace being like an airport right. where a lot of people, most of whom we have never met and we don't know who they are, they just, you know, go in a crowd and our employees are there in that crowd and we need to protect the information that they have and they can access wherever they are 24-7. Mm. Right. And security needs to be a service that just comes from the, the wall like electricity. Yep. So I'd say that we have been believers in zero trust before it was called zero trust. Right, right. minus one trust, I guess, yeah. yeah, way ahead of our time. But yeah, this has been a year of surprises, I guess. And, and um, Actually, I, I, I disagree. Really? Yeah, I, I was about to interrupt when you were talking earlier, your, your seven minutes of fame, <laughs> when you said that no one expected. Right. And actually that's wrong. There were a lot of people who had been expecting a pandemic for a very long time. And it has been discussed in, in pretty much all medias and I think the movies made of pandemics. I've seen the movies, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So how, how come it's a surprise? 
So I think we're sort of confusing the difference between unlikeliness and unpredictability. This has been unpredictable. Mm. Nobody could say that for certain in 2020 we'll have a global pandemic. Right. But it's not that it's unlikely that we are in the midst of a pandemic. It could have happened next year or last year. Mm. So, so, so what you're saying is companies could have prepared for this. They should have. Right. They should have had a scenario on what, what do we do if something like this happens. Exactly. Or, or what do we today so that we are prepared when this will happen? Mm. Because it's pretty much a question of time. And now the question is, what other things have we been ignoring? Hmm. So what are other things have we been ignoring? Well, an interesting question is, what could happen to our digital environment that would be comparable to a pandemic? Hmm. What, what would that bring to your mind? Oh, well, it reminds me of the story that was told to me by a friend of mine, Andy, who was working at Maersk, which is one of the best known mm -hmm. examples of companies which suffered a catastrophic cyber attack. This was the NotPetya attack of 2017. And on the first day of the attack, um, Andy, who was the chief information officer, was sitting at the headquarters and every single Windows workstation and every single Windows server had been wiped. No matter where he looked, if it was running Windows, it was gone. Like receptionist laptop all the way to developers workstations, it was all gone. So at some stage, he started thinking that, oh my God, is this just us? Or is this the whole world? Has every single Windows machine in the world been wiped today? Because that's what it looks like. Everything he looks at is, is, is gone. Now, it wasn't that bad. It was just them. But, but if you just it think about it. It was bad enough. It was bad enough, but think about it. Let's say some catastrophic breach of the Windows update mechanism, which sends mm -hmm. an update to every Windows workstation, forced update to every Windows workstation and, and laptop and wipes them or something like that. That's very unlikely, but it might just be something that should be planned for. So mm -hmm. it, it's doable. It's not impossible. Mm -hmm. So how, do, how would you plan for that? Buy a lot of Linux. <laughs> well, then you have to plan for the scenario that the same would happen with your Linux environment oh, yes. as well. You plan for thinking, well, another lesson from Andy. He, he had hard time reaching his people because all the data, all the contact information, all mm -hmm. the ways of contacting them was mm -hmm. on computers and phones. And their phones were empty because they were synced to their Office 365, which had been wiped. So they had no contacts on their phones. And of course, you can take a landline and call your, your office is in other countries, but then you have to know the phone number. And the phone numbers were on mm -hmm. computers and computers were gone. So, like, rehearsing how you would do it yeah. in real life is the yeah. answer. I think that's, that's a great point. Because then you get down to the nitty-gritty details of how do you cope when something like that happens. Mm -hmm. And a key word that you said was rehearse. So you actually need to exercise because that's the only way for you to understand what we would do and how well we could cope with it. Right, right. Another thing I've been using as an example is, is electricity grid itself. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, of course, we take electricity for granted, which is the same thing we do for any technology, which is good enough. Like, you know, we, we take cars for granted because they're so useful and, and nice. But electricity is, is such a great example because we really wouldn't be able to do much anything anymore without mm -hmm. electricity. And it isn't that old. Like, we got electricity grid in this city less than 150 years ago, which is, is mm -hmm. it hasn't been around forever. And there's a new technology called mobile communications, which is sort of critical for the electric grid mm -hmm. and for all of us. So they are joined at the hip. If one disappears, then the other one will will shut down as well. Yep. And our electric grids are usually designed on an N-1 principle, which means that the grid can survive one critical component shutting down. Mm -hmm. like, like a power plant. Like a power plant mm -hmm. under a heavy load situation. If the load is low, then of course, it doesn't matter. Mm. But under peak loads, one critical component can fail and the network should stay up. Mm -hmm. But two cannot. Right. And now the very pragmatic question is how have the countries and, and regions prepared for two 
critical component shutting down. How do you practice right. that? Yeah, and have you done the scenarios? Mm. Are you able to work? And that's a good example on, on how technology or how the technology revolutions are bringing us great benefits and, and great new risks. Mm -hmm. So Risto, do you think that the inter internet revolution itself has brought us more good or bad? Well, definitely more good for one simple reason. I don't think we could survive without it anymore. Mm. Because so it, it has to be good. We, we, ne we need the cat videos. Yeah, we, we absolutely need the billions of cat videos. <laughs> but so much of the efficiency of our environment is based on communications and IT systems. And probably more than a billion people would die if we would lose the internet. Just because there wouldn't be food, we wouldn't be growing as much food, there wouldn't be water, the logistics would fail, maybe mm. two billion. Really? I'm, okay. I'm, 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 I'm certain of that. Sounds, sounds horrible, but... Because we, yeah. we know that we are, we are using the resources of this world at a rate that is way beyond what the world produces mm. on an annual basis. And we do that in order to support the lifestyle we have and the population we have. With the internet down, with technology non-accessible, we couldn't support that population. So it, it so has to be good. Right, right, yeah, well. So it sounds like um, internet is both the best thing and the worst thing that has happened during our lifetime. Hmm. And as a basis of scenario planning, we need to think about the downsides and the upsides. So in this discussion now, in accordance to paranoid optimism, I'll get to be the optimist. I'll say that the internet is good, and you are the cybersecurity expert thinking about the downsides. So we have a good balance. Yes, we do. Yeah. And maybe that's a good, good way to end this discussion. Thank you, Risto. Thank you. And thank you so much. What a great and lively discussion. A lot of points for, for all of us to think about and, and consider. Um, always good when there's, when there's balance and, and good, good debates and, and thoughts. We're winding down in our program. All, all good things must come to an end, and, and we have our final uh, section starting. So we have a Q&A. And we received a lot of question, questions in advance from, from many of our participants. We're very grateful for that. It's, it's always uh, fantastic to be able to, to um, integrate a Q&A live session. So I have one, one question prepared for each of you, and I'd, I'd like to start with you, Risto. Um, these are certainly extraordinary circumstances and times. So how do you motivate people during these times? Well, I think purpose becomes the, the central focus point on motivation. It's always important. And companies and organizations that have a clear purpose mm. can attract people who are drawn to that purpose. And it's not a question of how many people there are who are drawn to that particular purpose. But if you have a crisp purpose and you can gather those people who are attracted to that purpose, you'll get a motivated workforce. We have people who love doing what they do. Mm -hmm. And that's what I have always loved about the cybersecurity business, because there are people who are attracted to being the good guys mm -hmm. and doing something that is technically very difficult, uh, picking any lock in the world. Yeah. and. I'm lucky enough to be in a business and having founded a business where I get to work with those people and we have a joint purpose. Thank you. Um, Mikko, moving on to, to you, um, which would you see are, are the biggest cybersecurity threats in, in 2021? Yeah, I often try to forecast the future and... and and always fail. <laughs> and always fail. Almost always. Almost always. It's hard, especially mm -hmm. in a fast-moving environment like this. It's hard, especially when you try to forecast beyond a year. But, you know, 2021 is still doable. And I could give abstract uh, mm -hmm. answers like, you know, cloud security problems or IoT threats. I'll give a practical, um, practical prediction. Yeah. What we call ransomware ver version 2 is going to become the single biggest problem in, in corporate security for 
small and medium sized and enterprise sized companies. Ransomware V2 is attacked from ransomware gangs where they don't make money by just encrypting your files and selling you a decryption key. That's been ransomware mm -hmm. version one, which has been the biggest problem for seven years now. Version two has already started and it's now gaining speed. It's the, the attacks where they do encrypt your files, but if you have backups, then they have a second ace in their sleeves, which is that mm -hmm. they've also taken copies of typically your email servers. And if you don't pay the ransom, then they will start leaking your information. And this attack methodology, methodology is, is a direct response to what companies have been doing to cope. Companies have been getting better and better in backup uh, processes to fight ransomware. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you lose your own files and you have to pay to get them back, if you have good backups, you have no problem. And now companies have been forced to get better backups, and this is now the reaction mm -hmm. from the ransomware gangs. So what do you do now? Well, how do you fight this? Um, well, the solution is not to pay the ransom, because more companies pay the ransom, the bigger the problem becomes. Mm -hmm. So you either have to be able to keep them out, or you have to be able to detect the breach very quickly, so you are able to react mm -hmm. before they are able to steal your files. And this is going to become the biggest problem of 2021. Hey, can I add something to yes. that? Because this is something we have been preaching for almost 30 years. Mm. Started when all banks were saying that they have never seen a single computer virus in the 90s. And every single one of those banks had been infected by viruses. They just <laughs> didn't dare admit it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is a big problem. Because when yeah. a company is, is breached and their email server is copied, then they should just say that it happened to us, it could happen to anyone mm -hmm. who will openly admit it, like, like Maersk mm -hmm. did. Sure. And they, they used that as a lesson to everyone. Yeah. And then not pay. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. now the situation is that, well, so few of our you know, competitors mm -hmm. have admitted that they have been breached. So if we do that, our customers will lose their trust in us. Yeah. But the fact is that every single company can be hacked. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Lena, welcome back. We have a, a final question for, for you as well. Um, briefly, could you elaborate on the on the working possibilities in the future and, and how you see it will affect the way we work? I think we we cannot hear you at the moment. Okay, sorry. There we uh, go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so I think that first of all, we have to acknowledge that we have given uh, our employees a freedom, and they have tasted a freedom. What it means, a freedom of choice. So I think that in the future, uh, those companies that will give employees freedom to decide on their own. Uh, according to my tasks today, according to my um, projects that I work on, uh, sh where would I would like to work, how I would like to work, with who I would like to work. And I think this uh, choice that the employee will have to make every day, where do I work uh, according to, um, to, to my current tasks uh, and uh, projects I have to work on, will define how the companies will uh, actually uh, structure their pro processes, security uh, systems, and uh, all the um, uh, communication issues, for example. So I think that uh, that uh, this this um, freedom that was tasted will actually stay and remain. Of course, we are not talking that all functions can be done from home, although we have been surprised of how many can be done from home. But I think that um, uh, this uh, uh, choice for the employee to work today from home or from the office will change uh, the mentality, uh, will have to change the uh, management models, will have to change the processes, uh, employment policies, and a lot of... Uh, um, structures and a lot of uh, processes around that. So I think uh, companies will have to utilize this opportunity, of, of course, in return, because if so far 
we have been focusing on finding employees only in our regions and our cities, we will have uh, access to talent pool, uh, which was uh, not uh, approachable by uh, the companies before. And eventually, this uh, remote work will not be, be the privilege of lucky ones, but it will be, uh, I think, on a daily uh, employment um, uh, discussions uh, upon applying to job. Uh, will the company will uh, let me work from re remotely from time to time, uh, and that will be. Uh, essential change in the way we work and the way the companies will have to see their future. Well, all right, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining us on, on Technopolis Workplace Talks today. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning, even though the live stream is ending, the event is definitely not over. Uh, remember our challenge, at least two meetings by end of business Friday. So you have today, tomorrow, and Friday to, to book meetings. You have no idea what business opportunities could wait for you there. Remember to visit the virtual booths as well. This was our first ever Brella live event, and we're curious to know, how did we do? So please give us your feedback, give us your opinion. We, we value that very much. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to our fantastic speakers. Thank you to Technopolis. Thank you to F-Secure. And um, let's end on a high note. So let's make work a great place for all of us. Thank you so much and see you, Umbrella. works together like a village. Then we began to build more and more squares. But we know that squares are not what you really want. You want to cross boundaries and peek over fences. You love limitless thoughts, 